Our next speaker is one who, uh, whose, uh, whose work you may have seen before. Uh, Jim Bevel has uh, presented programs at some of our receptions before uh, in, uh, on the Friday evenings. Uh, for those of you who want to uh, become patrons, you really do uh, get some, some uh, one-of-a-kind uh, experiences by coming to the Friday evening receptions before our Saturday sessions begin. Uh, and I was fascinated by the, uh, uh, the uh, talk on, on um, Texan currency that Jim gave at the Sterling Bank uh, 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 two or three years uh, ago. Uh, Jim, Jim comes by his money interest honestly. Uh, as you can see from your program, he's a cum laude graduate in finance. His book called The Paper Republic, The Struggle for Money, Credit, and independence of the Republic of Texas uh, will be uh, appearing uh, this summer. Um, Jim looks at a piece of money and sees a lot of things that the rest of us can't see. Uh, he can see the wheels within wheels that are going on behind the financial uh, 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 aspect of the money, but he can, he can also see the stories and the iconography that are historic that go into the money. And let's face it, when a, when a country becomes independent, they define themselves not only, as Sam Haynes said earlier, by their flags, but also by their money. Uh, I found that when I was in Belgium a few years ago, they have weird little avant-garde paintings on their money. I don't think the United States would do that. Uh, we, we think of ourselves in rather different ways than tiny countries squeezed between others. Uh, that we can put sort of weird little things on our money. Uh, and, and the Texans wanted to put things on their money that, that define them. And at a later date, you may be able to see Jim uh, uh, at another uh, meeting showing uh, how important that historical uh, and graphic iconography is as the Texans define themselves through the imagery that passes through their hands with their, uh, with their currency. Uh, today, he's going to be talking about the early stages of Texas money and Texas finance, uh, financing the Texas Revolution. Um, we had a talk from Ed Miller a few years ago here at this podium on New Orleans and the Texas Revolution. And some of you were kind of stunned and some a little ticked off uh, when Ed said that um, New Orleans merchants had more to do with the timing and dynamics of the Texas Revolution than the settlers here in Texas themselves. But he made a pretty good case for that thesis. And I'm sure that there are going to be some startling things said in a moment by Jim Bevel. So please welcome him to talk about financing the Texas Revolution. By the way, he's a banker too, so whatever you think of bankers, don't hold it against Jim. Or, <laughs> Or if you like him a lot, give him even more applause when he stands up right now. Thanks, Jim. And, it, and it's my pleasure to be here. As, as he pointed out, for some reason, my life seems to revolve around money. I am with UBS and River Oaks and I spent 25 years, or, or am in 25 years, in the securities and the investment and finance business in Houston. And I'm also a numismatist. I collect coins and paper money because it relaxes me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does. It relaxes me. And, and I wrote a book about the money of the Republic, which you'll enjoy. It will relax you and stimulate you. And so it actually... It reads different than what you just heard because it, it takes Mexico from the point of view of the Spanish and the Mexican point of view and how the Anglos came in and took it versus looking at it from the top going down. And I, I who was it? It was Bill I was talking to last night at the patrons party. He said, well, how do you find this stuff? Well, I'm the president of a statewide organization of collectors, the Texas Numismatic Association. And when you hang out with other collectors, you, you know what they collect. And when you know other people that collect Texas money and Texas currency and Spanish colonial stuff, you get to see their collections. And, and when you get to see enough of them, I began to see patterns that were developing. 
So I asked them if I could image these. So the imaging that came for the Paper Republic was taken from 21 different private collections, most of which has never been seen other than by the owners. So it's kind of an eye-opening experience because as her years of study, I find that these old scraps of paper have not only yielded new information on the subject of early Texas finances, but in several cases, they correct the historical record. And when these pieces are presented in chronological order, they form a paper trail through the secret door to the past. And this untold story is as much about personalities and hardships as it about money and finances. So I'm gonna give you a glimpse of what I found behind that door and as we examine the people, the places, and the finances of the Texas Revolution. And this is where the story picks up in chapter four. In November of 1835, there was a consultation that gathered from across Texas at San Felipe de Austin. And they were there to select delegates for the formation of a provisional government. And they elected Branch T. Archer as the chairman and Henry Smith as the provisional governor. Among the highest of priorities, it was decided that money needed to be raised to finance the war for independence because hostilities had commenced in September of 1835 in San Antonio de Bejar when there are 200 Mexican cavalry gathered along you know, the, the, San, uh, the Guadalupe River. As, but it's important to realize that as this provisional government was formed, the founders established a treasury department. It was initially composed of a committee on finance with the offices of treasurer, auditor, and controller added shortly thereafter. And the treasury department was established despite a lack of funds. They had no money on hand, and they had none which could be dispersed. But the importance of having claims against the government properly audited, having regular accounts kept, and having various checks and balances in the system was not lost on the new treasury. So they spent money that they didn't have, and they issued promissory notes and payments against future revenues. So how did they finance the revolution? There are about six different ways. Number one, they taxed. They had ordinances and decrees that levied taxes against the people but most of them were fighting, so there was nobody to collect from. They begged. They sent emissaries to the United States and solicited donations for Texas. They borrowed. So they, this is the information of the paper money system. This is what we're gonna focus on today. Robbing, they granted letters of market and reprisal for privateers to go out and sack ships and disrupt the shipping in New Mexico and literally steal the goods for a small percentage of it. Cheating, now this was the information of the paper money system, which came quite a bit later in stealing the outright confiscation of Mexican property and the esconding of everything that could have been used to the army. So this was our forefathers, taxing, begging, borrowing, <laughs> robbing, cheating, and stealing. <laughs> now, once the public faith was officially pledged, they began to issue promissory notes. Here's an example. This is a receipt for a rifle received San Felipe de Austin, December the 1st, 1835 of W. Joshua Fletcher, a rifle gun valued at $22, which I promised to take in the service of the provisional government of Texas and return the same on my return from the army of the people and the government aforesaid. Now, down below you have the uh, signature of William P. Harris who guaranteed the return of the rifle. He was the brother of John R. Harris after whom Harris County was named. So these were merely receipts for things the guy who this belonged to, Joshua Fletcher, he was the treasurer of the republic. He wasn't going to need it in his office. The early San Felipe notes will say, in the name of the people free and sovereign, if you've read the papers of the Texas Revolution, you see the document, the name of the people free and sovereign, the treasurer of, the, of the Texas will pay to under J. Samuel Stivers or order the same $228.37. Samuel Stivers was, they call him the big doc, the big doctor who, who tended to the wounded after the Battle of San Jacinto. This was signed by John B. McMullen, the chairman of the Committee on Finance, and John W. Moody. Now, they were only going to raise so much money getting a donation here. Give me a rifle. Give me your gun. Give me supplies. Let me write a receipt. So they sent Stephen F. Austin, Branch T. Archer, and William Wharton to New Orleans on a fundraising mission. Their goal was to raise $250,000 for the Texas government. So they're here in New Orleans, and they stayed at this hotel because it was the fundraising center for the South, especially for Texas. And they had this meeting at this hotel, and it was chaired by a man named William Christie, who was about as sympathetic a man to the Texas cause as it could be. He was a veteran of the War of 1812. He was a personal friend of Sam Houston. And like you said, War War Wharton was a warmonger, and they all stood there, and they gave these impassioned plea for Texas, help us, we're being depressed by the Mexicans, we need loans, et cetera. 
And a lot of these people were financiers, some of them were land speculators, some were just merely lodgers of the hotel who just kind of wandered in. <laughs> but it didn't gather steam until somebody came up with the idea, why don't we take land at 50 cents per acre? So they grazed a $250,000 loan. This is one of the original loans signed by Austin, Archer, and Wharton. These came in, in, in $320 pieces. You'll see this one says, received of Robert Triplett, $32 is the first installment of loan of $320. For $320, land in Texas may be taken at 50 cents per acre. That's how they're going to pay it back. And you see on the border it says 640 acres of land. So for $32 down, and they advanced $20,000 of this loan down, but they would not advance the other $180,000 until, number one, Texas had declared independence, because otherwise they wouldn't have a legitimate government to collect it from. And number two, the terms of the loan had to be ratified Texas Congress. So they assumed, they assured them that was planned for March. So this is one of, this is one of the original notes bearing this. This is the $50,000 loan. The $50,000 loan was signed a week later. Uh, as you can see, um, Wharton had already taken off to Kentucky. He was already in Louisville, and the other two were left behind. They signed these loans. But think about this. To raise $250,000, the Texas government, or, or the, the, the Texas was pledging 500,000 acres of land. You think the real estate bust now is speculative. <laughs> Texas didn't even have title to the land. <laughs> Mexico had title to the land. And Santa Ana's army had just crossed the Rio Grande with the goal of crushing all the Anglos and driving them across the Sabine River at the point of a bayonet. So even at UBS, we would consider this to be speculative. <laughs> so you get back to San Felipe de Austin and realize Austin, Texas doesn't even exist. San Felipe de Austin is a little town on the Brazos River. It was the site of Stephen F. Austin's first colony. This is where the first promissory notes began to be issued. This one, Joshua Fletcher Esquire. All the San Felipe notes will say Joshua Fletcher Esquire across the top. Treasurer, Provisional Government of Texas will pay to Arasta Smith or order $25 out of a money in the treasury not otherwise appropriated. This puts Def Smith, the famed Texas scout, in San Felipe de Austin on January the 13th, 1836. Some of these are on pink paper, some are on blue paper. Uh, this one says, um, the, treasurer, uh, the treasurer of the provisional government of Texas will pay to Caleb M. Tennant or to his legal representatives. See, all these notes were designed to be assignable. All of them were supposed to be transferable because they were IOUs and if what good does it get paid with something if you can't transfer it to someone else so these did serve as a form of money in the early days of the provisional government now in addition to San Felipe there were agents which were scattered across Texas to procure supplies for the army uh, one of these uh, was a receipt signed at Quintana it says received of McKinney and Williams 46 six pound cannonballs Quintana January 24th 1836, J.W. Fannin, Jr., agent for provisional government. James Fannin signed this receipt for cannonballs in Quintana the very day that he sailed from Velasco to go down to Copano Bay and began the march up to Goliath. The, the, the pays of the note, uh, of the receipt, McKinney and Williams would have taken this and exchanged this for a draft on the government as proof that, in fact, they had furnished arms. Now, people talk about McKinney and Williams as, as as merchants, but they were arms dealers. That's what they were. They were arms dealers. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, one other thing that's interesting about this note is, you know how they always called him Fanning? You read about the old papers of the Texas, they'll call him Fanning's Command. One of the reasons that may have come from is that look at the way he ran the junior on the end of his name. Makes it look like his name is Fanning. Now, McKinney and Williams, these guys were off, were, um, like I said, they were a mercantile firm based in Velasco. They were authorized to borrow $100,000 on behalf of the Texas government. They took these bearer bonds. They took, this is one of the bearer bonds here. They took them to New Orleans, Thomas T. McKinney did, and tried to, to, tried to peddle them, tried to get them, but he couldn't find any investors that wanted the 10% interest because there was no assurance that they were going to get back. What they wanted was the land. He didn't come out empty-handed, by the way. He executed drafts on his own firm and brought back a shipload of gunpowder for the re revolution. However, it far exceeded his capacity to pay. In other words, he wrote hot checks for it, which forced, which forced the uh, 
uh, the dealer that sold him the gunpowder into bankruptcy, which is Toby and Company. So I guess all is fair in love and war, but that's, uh, this is how they did it. Now, so the convention was to be held at the little town of Washington on the Brazos. This is the picture of the old blacksmith shack at Independence Hall. It was taken probably in the late 1890s. It was an old gunsmith shop. This is where the Constitution was written. This is where a Declaration of Independence uh, was signed. And this is where these promissory notes were, were written. You'll notice distinguishing characteristics. Number one, it doesn't say San Felipe de Austin here anymore. It doesn't say Joshua Fletcher uh, Esquire. So we know it's in Washington. The date, February the 29th, tells us that it's a leap year. It also was written in the same, it was also was written in the same uh, little building where they signed the Declaration of Independence, possibly with the same pen. This other example, which was made payable to James W. Robinson, who was the um, Lieutenant Governor, who was the, the acting governor at that time, curiously, it was dated March the 4th of 1836, two days after independence was declared, yet they still called it the Provisional Government of Texas. And you see the little lines, see the fold here, see the fold here, see the fold. This is a cancellation later, but you see the little folds? That indicates that somebody, probably James W. Robinson, took this piece, folded it in his pocket, carried it with him in his knapsack or in the pocket when he fought at the Battle of San Jacinto about a month later. Because they didn't leave money behind. There was no place to store it. They took it with them. They carried it with them. It went everywhere they go because there were no banks in Texas. Now. Speaking of the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Independence was, was declared on March the 2nd. They signed the document on March the 3rd, but what do they have? They had a handwritten document. Okay, who cares? Nobody can see it. It's all sitting in this building. So they had scribes make copies of the document, and they had an order to bring it out to the people, and that's what this says. And I, I found this by accident when I was looking for other stuff up at SMU. It says, on motion of Mr. Goodrich, Resolved that five copies of the Declaration of Independence be prepared, one to be sent forth with to Bihar, one to Goliad, one to Nacogdoches, one to Brazoria, one to San Felipe, and one to Natchitoches, and that the printer at San Felipe be requested to print in hand bill form for distribution 1,000 copies, and that a committee of three be appointed to carry the above resolution into effect. Everything I've ever read until I saw this said that there were five copies to be sent. But yet, here's a sixth one to go to Nacogdoches, Louisiana, to tell the United States and to tell the people of the United States that Texas had defiantly declared independence. More importantly, to tell the Linden Group in New Orleans that they had, they had, they had uh, declared independence and that they wanted the money. So they get a little guy, they put him on a horse, he rides from Washington on the Brasses down here to San Felipe, where Gail Borden takes the Telegraph and Texas Register, the newspaper, uh, out of the printing press, he cues it up and they print the Declaration of Independence. A friend of mine owns this. This is from the first printing of 100 copies. It's one of the three original printed broadsides, still in private hands. It was printed by Baker and Bordens in, Aust in, in San Felipe in March of 1836. This is what the people saw. It was printed in handbill form. They had inadvertently left out two of the names of the signers, including George Childress, who was the author of the document. That's how we know which printing that it came from. But the rest, the other 900 were later just probably scattered to the wind. But this is what the people saw. This is what got the word out. This is told, what told them that they had declared independence. So while they're at Washington on the Brazos, they had, uh, the Constitution was adopted at midnight on March the 16th of 1836. David G. Burnett was inaugurated as president at, at 4 o'clock in the morning, on the morning of the 17th. So they had a session before they broke up and went to Harrisburg. Two of the, two of the people from New Orleans, Robert Triplett, and um, William Fairfax Gray were attending the convention. They had helped, they had copied documents, they had acted as scribes, they had transcribed things. And finally, they gave, Robert, they gave Triplett, the lead financier of the authority, to, to speak to the convention. He gave them this impassioned plea, why they need the money, please ratify the loan, we'd be happy to help the cause, because they wanted that land. And the, the convention passed the motion and said, we'll defer everything to the government ad, ad interim. And as William Fairfax Gray said, he said they blinked the question. So now everything's on the back of the government. So the government, now they've had the news of the fall of the Alamo, now they're, they're really at risk of being captured at, at really at any given night. <laughs> so they evacuate the government from Washington the Brazos down here to Harrisburg. Now Harrisburg was a little town, not much more than a sawmill town, on the banks of Buffalo Bayou. It's just over 
Um, it's just east of the Turning Basin on the Houston Ship Channel, and it's right behind the present-day John Harris Elementary School on the bio. And we know that they were there because while they were there, they came to a compromise agreement. One of the things that the lenders in New Orleans had wanted, they said, we want the priority of the locations of the land. When we get the land, we want the priority of locations. And the government said, no, you can't have it. We want, we want the, um, um, the soldiers to have the priority of location. What's the most important thing when you buy real estate? Location, location, location. And they knew that. So as a sweetener, what they did, the government says, well, we'll give you another 44 leagues of land, which is 142,000 acres. So now they're up to pledging 642,000 acres of land that they don't have title to. <laughs> but they funded it. Now, Triplett says, look, I, I can't bind the parties in New Orleans for the 180, but the authorized me to bind them for the 50. So he advances the whole of the second loan in Harrisburg on April Fool's Day, April the 1st of 1836. <laughs> Signed at the town of Harrisburg on the first day of April, 1836, David G. Burnett signed as the president of Texas. So this is an original document, but signed by Burnett, acknowledging another private loan of $2,000 by Triplett. Now, I wasn't going to tell this, but Michael Strupp talked me into it. What they did with this loan, Burnett says, okay, you have this land. He says, he says I need another $2,000. And Triplett said, well, I don't have it, but if you'll give me land script, for any land in Texas, he said, we'll make another loan. So he got together the money. They advanced. It was actually $1,920. So they make this $2,000 loan to the president. And they said, OK, just, just go find your land. So here's what happens. Burnett's got the money. He appoints Triplett as an agent for the government. Says, go find the supplies. Triplett, William Fairfax Gray, and Sterling Nevitt get on the horse. They ride to Lynchburg. They get on Lynchburg. They get a boat. They sail down the Galveston. Guess what's waiting in the harbor? two supply ships. Triplet boards the boats, gives them the drafts. They're full of supplies. Why are they there? They're waiting to get paid. Pays them, sends them up, up into the bay, says these are the depot stations, meet the army, we've got people up there, get them out, get, get it out to where they belong to. So what do these guys do? These guys go and they start staking out their land. So they survey 640 acres at the tip of Point Volibur and 1,280 acres of waterfront property on Galveston Island, which is where the city of Galveston presently stands. Then they go back up towards Harrisburg and, they, and, 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 and they're trying to get this land. So they're on the steamboat Cayuga. They get to Harrisburg. One of them is riding towards Harrisburg and the government had evacuated on the steamboat. This is April the 13th and they're chugging down Buffalo Bayou. So now this is the de facto capital of the Republic is a steamboat and it's going down the bio, okay? Now, so where does it go? Where does this thing go? This thing goes down, they start here, they go past Ventures Bridge, they, and then he gets off at Lynchburg and they had this little conversation because what happens is they met up at Lynchburg and they said, okay, we picked our land. Well, what do they want? Well, $1,200 of waterfront property on Galveston Island, which would control the entire harbor, all the beaches, and the entrance to the bay. And they said, okay, this is what we picked out. So they signed for one of them, didn't sign for the other two. And the, the, the side story here, it's all explained in the book, is that Burnett later took that ground grant back and then gave it to Triplett, but they had sold it to somebody else. So it messed up the title. These guys were going to build a city on the island of Galveston because they had two friends that had come from New York. They were looking to build a city in Texas, and they tried to sell in that land. But the title was bad because the, the surveys overlapped. So these two brothers that summer went up to Harrisburg. But because one of the Harris brothers was suing the estate of the other, that title was messed up. So they ended up, because of that document, locating their city at the intersection of White Oak and Buffalo Bio and decided to name it Houston at that point in time. But that's where it was supposed to go. So in any event, Burnett gets off at Lynch's Ferry. He rides down to New Washington. Well, when the Mexicans captured Harrisburg, there were two Frenchmen still printing the paper. One of them talked and said, hey, I think they're going to be down here. Why don't, you, why don't you go? He said, I think the government's going to be at Morgan's Point. Let them go. So Alamante gets a, a, a crew, and they double time it down to Morgan's Point. As they get there, Burnett, is, Burnett is, ro is, is, is in a boat. And one of the slaves saw the Mexicans coming over the hill. And he said, Mr. Burnett, the Mexicans are coming. He gets on the boat, and they said that he was, you know, they wouldn't fire at him because Alamante was a gentleman. Maybe they were just out of range. But this famous event is captured, this dramatic, on the Republic of Texas $10 bill, which was issued in Houston. 
Here's the boat. Here's the steamboat. This is probably representative of the schooner flash. That bluff out here <coughs> is the, the bluff at Morgan's Point. It looks just like the bluff at Red Bluff. That's where this is, which is in between Seabrook and Laporte. That's the bluff that the engravers put on the note. Okay, so what happened then? Well, that obviously delayed their actions. They came up here to try to capture the strategic crossing at the San Jacinto River. The next day, they run in and they had the Battle of San Jacinto where we, you know, they wiped out the Mexican army. Yes, it was important. I. <laughs> And I, I took seventh grade history at San Jacinto Intermediate School in Pasadena, <laughs> the town where they caught Santa Ana. And they brought Santa Ana, they captured him the next day, and they took him before the wounded Sam Houston, who was chewing an opiate because of a severe leg wound that he had had. And Santa Ana was visibly nervous. He was afraid he was going to get shot or hung or both. And so Houston offered him an opiate to calm his nerves. And that afternoon, they, they effectively ended the war. They, they signed an armistice, which was a ceasefire, an agreement to withdraw troops from Texas. So the fate of Texas was sealed by two guys sitting under a tree, both of which were a little bit stoned on opium. <laughs> True story. All right. But in the meantime, the Burnett government, see, Burnett and the, and the government, they were all the way down here in Galveston. And they had the warships, the Brutus and the Independence and the Invincible stationed there with a can there waiting for this invasion that never came. So five days later, there was two men that came down, Robert J. Calder and Benjamin Franklin, brought the news to him that the government, you know, that they won the Battle of San Jacinto. And we know they're in Galveston because we see this receipt. And it says, received of Mr. Horton and Clements, 21 shovels and 13 spades for the use of the Republic of Texas by order of the president, Asa Brigham, Signed, Galveston Bay, April of 1836. And you know, I looked at this and I kept wondering why would the president order shovels and spades? That's not really a presidential type order, is it? And a friend of mine dated this. He pulled up the, the, the duplicate that's in the state, the, the original is in the Texas State Library, and at the top it says, Galveston, April the 26th of 1836. And all of the rest of the language is exactly the same, right down to the misspelling of a republic with a K on the end of it. So it's no, it's the same one. Plus, this one says duplicate on the reverse. And it's if they were, they were signed this on a boat somewhere. But it was the same day. April the 26th would have been after they received the news of the Battle of San Jacinto. And yet it would have been before they boarded the steamboat Yellowstone and went back up to tour the battlefield. One of the men ca that came down from San Jacinto to give them the news was Robert J. Calder, who was the commander of K Company at the Battle of San Jacinto. One of the nine boys that was killed in the battle was Benjamin Rice Brigham, who served in Calder's company. Calder undoubtedly told the father, Asa Brigham, who was a high-ranking government official, by the way, your son was killed at the battle. And so I looked at this and I realized that what this represents is a father using his official post in the government to secure 21 shovels and 13 spades for the use of the Republic of Texas to bury the dead at San Jacinto, which included his son. So they take the shovels and spades, they put them on the steamboat Yellowstone, and they go back up to the battlefield. Well, when they got there, they had already buried the Texan dead. And they made no attempt to bury the Mexican dead. So I don't know what happened to the shovels. They probably took them back, built Fort Davis. I don't know. So anyway, they were all buried when they got there. But what they did find was $12,000 of Mexican silver that had been, been taken out. And we've read accounts of the, the $12,000 in silver dollars or the 12,000 silver pesos. But until the archaeological team dug this up, and I believe Greg Dimmick found this coin, we didn't know what they were. But it tells us a few things. Number one, it's a silver eight reales piece, and it's uncirculated. By uncirculated, I mean there's no visible sign of wear. You can see the crispness of the rays around the, the Liberty Cap. You can see the, the spelling on the Liberty Cap. You can see the feathers on the eagle. You can see the buttons and the spines and the cactus. This thing was brand spanking new when it was lost, had not passed in circulation. And the date, 1834, in its date, it has a Zacatecas mint mark. It means it was struck in Zacatecas. 
what this tells us, this tells us that, you know, we knew that Texas was not the only Mexican state rebelling against, against centralist rule. The other state that was rebelling against central school was the Mexican state of Zacatecas. And Santa Ana led an army to Zacatecas in May of 1835 to crush the rebellion. And on May the 18th of 1835, when they captured the Sibidian city and took the governor into custody, they looted, they looted the town and he confiscated the assets of the Zacatecas Mint in the name of the government and he used that silver to bring in supplies, to bring in troops and to finance the expedition to crush the other Northern Rebellion, which was in Texas. So they take the money, they take Sam Houston, they take Alamante, they take the prison, they all sail back to Velasco, they go back to Velasco and Yellowstone. Houston gets on the flora, he goes to New Orleans for medical care, stays at the home of William Christie, the notary who um, had drafted those Texian loans. The rest of them go down 40 miles down the beach to Velasco. Now Velasco is best known for the Treaty of Velasco, but it, today it's a little community where the Brazos River hits the um, um, Gulf of Mexico known as Surfside Beach, Texas. This is Freeport. So it's Freeport. That's where it comes from. And we know that they're here because once again, they start issuing obligations. Treasurer of the Government of Texas will pay to William Pre Brown or order $100 out of any money in Treasury. Signed Velasco, June the 17th, 1836. Once again, by Asim Brigger, Brigham, the auditor. Now, the first printed notes or printed obligations showed in Velasco. This one was to Augustus V. Sharp, who was a survivor of the massacre of Goliad. Actually escaped, made his way all the way down to Galveston, uh, showed up in Velasco. Somehow, somebody vouched for his service record and said, oh, by the way, kind of get paid. So he got paid. <laughs> Collectors called this the Sphinx note because of the depiction of an Egyptian Sphinx on the border of a Republic of Texas obligation. Now, the war wasn't over yet. Now, it, it may have been over. It's like, the is the recession over? Well, you don't know. It may, the worst may be behind you, but you don't know. There were rumors of another Mexican invasion, and Thomas J. Russ sent Major Isaac, Burton, Isaac W. Burton and 20 mountain rangers down to Copano Bay to patrol just in case, you know, to keep on the lookout. That's what this says. Republic of Texas, Velasco, 8th of July, 1836. The quartermaster of this post will pay to the order of Major Isaac W. Burton $9,496, which is the amount of prize money due to him and his men. Now, prize money is a naval term, which is refers to a ship being captured and the cargo sold and distributed as a prize of war amongst the captors. These are 16 guys on horses. So what, what had happened was they were patrolling about the third day they were down there. In the middle of June, they saw a Mexican supply ship, the Watchman, coming into Copano Bay. It was loaded with 520 barrels of food. They didn't know what was on it, but they knew it was a Mexican ship. So they hid the horses in the bushes, and four of them frantically hailed the ship in Spanish. They raised the American flag. No answer. They lowered it. They raised the Mexican flag. They continued to hail the ship in Spanish. So the ship sends out a rowboat to help them. So as the rowboat comes in, 16 heavily armed rangers overpower the boat, they row it back out to the ship. Fortunately, it was foggy, and they couldn't see everything that was going on, just like in the movies. They go up to the side of the ship, they climb the rail, they got guns blazing, they capture the watchman. Now, they tried to sail it back to Velasco, but the winds were in the wrong direction. So they just anchored it and proceeded to consume part of the 520 barrels of food that was on board. So they. <laughs> They sat out there and they had a picnic. Three days later, two other supply ships come in, the schooners Comanche, Butler, and the Watchman. So they raise the Mexican ensign, they give them the semaphore signal, they tell them, they tell them that, you know, all's clear, they invite, they invite the two captains on board for a drink. They fall for it. They capture all three ships, they sail them back to Velasco, and that's what this is said. For the capture of the cargoes of the schooners Comanche and Fanny Butler, you'll pay the above sums out of said cargoes and their costs. Signed by Theodore Lee, he secretarily signed David Burnett's signature. And one of the rangers said, I guess after this we're going to be known as the Horse Marines. But that's what this was, the payment to the Horse Marines. The first military pay certificates came out of Alaska. These were certificates entitlement for military pay. This certificate entitles Robert E. Handy and William Lusk, attorneys for Thomas Beckley, $24 for three months service. Establishes the private's pay of $8 a month. Signed at Velasco, September 13th. Signed by George Washington Poe as the acting paymaster general. Now, Velasco was only meant to be a temporary capital. So they moved the capital, they, they, they moved it to Columbia, which is now West Columbia, Texas, about seven miles west of Angleton. This is the little building 
that uh, the Republic occupied. This is where Sam Houston's first administration started. This is where the first Congress of the Republic was held. Here's another view of the building. This is about 1899. It was destroyed by the Galveston hurricane of 1900. As you can tell from the picture, it didn't take much of a wind to blow this thing down <laughs> at that point. But this little lean-to side right here was the Treasury Department where Brigham and Poe and the others began to issue these military pay certificates. This one is interesting, a certificate to William Head, same pay, $24 for three months service. This soldier entered the Texas Army on the sixth day of March, the very day that the Alamo fell, which establishes that Houston was actively recruiting in the East. Now, he didn't stop recruiting in the East. Uh, this soldier, this was actually signed by uh, Sidney O. Pennington as an attorney for this soldier. And they did that because these soldiers didn't have time to travel to the Capitol and get paid. Sometimes they'd have an attorney and he'd, he'd and they would collect the payments for 10, 20, 30, 40 soldiers at a time. So it's very common to see these paid on the half of an attorney. This guy joined the army on April the 19th, two days before the Sanders said, come on, we're gonna go whip the Mexicans, get in line, sign here. It's exactly what was happening down here. This uh, certificate, uh, once again, privates pay, $24 for three months of service, Captain William Becknell's company. Well, Becknell ran a company of mounted rangers to patrol the, the Red River area against Indian attacks, which is north of where Dallas and Fort Worth is today. That just indicates the far reaches of the Treasury Department and, and having a little guy on a horse go all the way down to Columbia, pick up the pay for the soldiers, ride it back and distribute it, even though they had no banks in Texas and there was no way for them to cash this stuff. But at least they had the IOUs, right? This is what they call a Black Star Note. They did call them the Texan Army. They call this a Texian Army Certificate. George W. Shaw, $24 for bounty, perhaps as an enlistment bonus in the Texan Army. This is signed again by Poe, by Bernard B., who was the Secretary of War. I was at a coin show one time, and I was flipping through this dealer's inventory, and I saw this, this interesting certificate here. I noticed it was payable to a Michael Goheen, and it said, well, it's $100 for four months service, and sure enough, he was ranked officer's pay. He was captain's pay of $25 a month. He was a, he was a, a veteran of the siege and the storming of Bihar. He uh, hooked up with the Texas Army, did two stints, and he was a true Texas hero. Goheen was one of those people that um, came to Texas looking for land, and he ended up finding a fight. And uh, he was actually married to the daughter of John W. Moody, who was the auditor, so he was from a fairly wealthy family. You'll see also that his was payable to a substitute, so he paid another man, Josh, John Weber, uh, to substitute for part of his military service during this particular term. Okay, so they're in Columbia, uh, first session of Congress. They're on October the 4th of 1836. Asa Brigham, the treasurer, gives his report to Congress. He says, you know, we're perplexed. He said, we have a host of additional claims against the new government for horses and other property destroyed, but you have no way to pay them. He said, what do you mean? He said, what do you amount to? He said, well, these amount to $28,000 in claims. Well, you've all heard of the runaway scrape where people abandoned everything, left the dishes on the table and so forth. And what happened was Sam Houston's army took everything that could have been in use and for them, and they destroyed everything that could have been used for the government, you know, I mean, to the Mexicans. What a lot of people don't know is all these citizens got lawyers, and they petitioned the government of Columbia and said, we want to get paid. So now they had $28,000 in claims. Look at this one. Freeman Wilkinson, tobacco destroyed, $1,543. Whiskey and brandy destroyed, $250. You know, a glass of whiskey was a dime back then. I mean, that's a lot of whiskey. Uh, they probably used it to burn the town. Um, look at the horses, lost horse, 250, lost horse, 175, lost horse, $35. This is my favorite, Thomas Robinson, expenses whilst to prison, $150. How the heck do you have $150 expenses while you're a prisoner? I mean, just, just go figure. It, it is out of this dilemma that the payment system of warrants or audit certificates, as they're also called, became firmly cemented in the Republic. If you had a claim for payment which was made through the office of the auditor, it had to be validated, supported with receipts or other evidence. It was found to be valid. A certificate was issued out of funds not otherwise appropriated. If the funds were available, the certificate served a government check. If not, it served as an IOU. This is true for all the warrants, not only issued from Columbia, but also from Houston and Velasco and Washington as well. Now, October the 18th, Sam Houston takes office. First thing he wants to do, move. I want to move it to my namesake city. 
So it was actually John Kirby Allen, a member of Congress, argued the case for selecting this city as a new seat of government. Four ballots and a slim majority, the government said, okay, you can move the capital of Houston, but you gotta build your own capital and you gotta put up your own money. So they said, okay, we'll spend $10,000, we'll build us a new capital building. But for several months, the capital remained in Columbia. And we know it remained in Columbia because they're issuing treasury warrants now out of Columbia for people who redeem their military pay certificates. Now they get a treasury warrant. This one says Holman George, $127.79, April the 4th of 1837. But looky here, you see a subtraction of 106. I turn this note over on the back and it says, oh, I gotta pay my taxes? Received on the within draft $106.07 for taxes. You can have this money back. So he just paid it back. So a lot of times the government just got their own money back. This soldier didn't do that. This was dated April the 14th of 1837, F. Bennett. You know, it was, it was $50 for payment of the military. But look here, it says funded December 31st of 39. The capital had moved from Houston, I mean from Columbia, to Houston and then to Austin, and you were well into the Lamar administration two and a half years later before this soldier got paid for his military service. So it just shows you the, the drying up and the lack of money on behalf of the Republic. So now they're in Houston. This is the Capitol building. It sits on, on the, the plot of land where the Rice Hotel does today. It's at the Main Street and Texas Avenue. This is where the Congress of the Republic met. This is where Sam Houston had his executive offices. This is also where the Treasury Department was. And we know that they're here because now the obligations say Houston, June 20th, 1837. Treasurer of the Public of Texas will order to William Porter, an assignee of Charles Furnaby, by Attorney G. Long, three-party payment on this note. Please take this money. Please, I'll assign it to you. Give me whatever you can. This stuff was selling for 15 cents on the dollar. They even ran out of printed paper. You notice that's on paper? So they came up with this great idea. They drew lines on it. There was the, the, There's two things that are interesting about this note for $65, one of which there was actually a little guy in the treasury office whose job it was to take a pen and a ruler and to draw lines on the warrant to make it look official. He was the graphics department <laughs> for the Republic of Texas. And what's even more unusual is that the auditor, John W. Moody, and the controller, Francis Lubbock, were in the office working on New Year's Day, January the 1st of 1838. Now, most of the, 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 the warrants that you're going to see out of Houston were, um, were for military terms. This one is payable to, this is the most common variety, $294.31, but who it's payable to? John N. Seguin. This is Juan Seguin. Seguin was at the Alamo, left the Alamo to carry a courier message to Houston, never went back during the siege, fought at the Battle of San Jacinto, and it was he that, that came back and, and, and supervised the, the burying of the Alamo dead. One of the things I think is very interesting about this particular warrant is that uh, it's addressed not to Juan Seguin, it's to John N. Seguin. And on the reverse, he endorsed it as John N. Seguin, his Americanized or his Anglo name. And we had this piece at the uh, patrons party last night, which is kind of cool. This is in the University of Houston's collection. Uh, this is to James A. Sylvester. Who knows who James A. Sylvester is? Flag of yeah. He was the flag bearer of San Jacinto, and he was a soldier who caught Santa Ana and took him back to San Jacinto where they identified him. This is his paycheck for his military service when he caught Santa Ana. I mean, now how cool is that? And it was signed, <laughs> it was signed by Elijah Peace, who was the comptroller and became a Union sympathizer uh, during the war and was later the governor of Texas during Reconstruction. Now his counterpart, uh, Francis Lovick, was anything but a Union sympathizer, who was actually the governor of Texas when, uh, you know, when Texas um, succeeded. Now this particular payment is made to F.W. Smith. It was for the naval contingent, and it was signed on October the 24th of 1838. October the 24th of 1838 was the very same day that the naval contingent uh, was up in Baltimore and they had arrangements to buy a side paddle wheel steamer called the Charleston, which they refitted with armaments. When it crossed the Sabine River, they renamed that steamer 
as the Zavala. So this, this particular note was, was signed on the very day that they acquired the steamer Zavala. So they're in Houston now, and they're about to, to, to open up Congress. They were going to have a, open a session of Congress in May, and Treasury Secretary Henry Smith prepared a detailed report of the audited claims and the obligations of the government. So he says, and then so they said, what do you find? He said, well, we've got $604,985 in audited claims, valid claims that have been presented in the government owes, $604,000. In addition to the audited claims, there was another million and seven thousand dollars that had been expended as appropriated by the Texas Congress in 1836, 850,000 dollars of which was military claims. So now they've got they've got bills, they've got obligations of a million six hundred and four thousand dollars. He says, "Okay, Henry, how much do we collect in taxes?" He said, "Well, sir, that would be one thousand five hundred and sixty-nine dollars, <laughs> one hundred percent of which was their own paper that had been endorsed." and give them back to them. <laughs> okay, this, this is a credit crisis right here. <laughs> now, so Smith presents another report on May the 12th, 1837. He details this plan for revenue raising. He suggested a new series of taxes that would raise an additional $200,000. He proposed direct taxes on land and all other property at one half percent. So when you're protesting your taxes at Harris County, you can thank Henry Smith. That's where that started. Um, other taxes, ad valorem tax was going to yield $125,000, a license tax, wholesale, retail dealers, public shows, billiard halls, drinking tavern. And he said, okay, well, I think we can raise $375,000 a year. So they bring that up. Now, in the meantime, virtually all of the outstanding drafts that had been issued since the earliest days at San Felipe in Washington were outstanding. None of those were paying interest. That stuff was selling at 15, 16, 17 cents on the dollar in the streets of New Orleans, sometimes less. And these people had that knocked on the door, patriotism aside, they wanted the money, they wanted to get paid. Smith's answer was one of postponement. He said, if I could have all the outstanding claims of the audited drafts consolidated in one common pool or a fund, he said the debt would become much more manageable for the government. So encouraged by his plan and Houston's endorsement of the they, what they did is they developed a plan to consolidate this. They took the form, they put newspaper articles out there, they put advertisements, and they called in all the outstanding treasury warrants and the audited paper, and they exchanged these odd denomination of notes for stock, stock in the Consolidated Fund of Texas. And this was in $100 shares. They had $100, they had $500, they had $1,000, they had $5,000. This one's actually paid to McKinney Williams, and $10,000 increments. So. They took and they, they, they pooled all this money. And so for the creditors that had seen their, their obligation selling at 15 or 20 cents on the dollar, uh, the, the, the kicker here was that the Republic was going to pay 10% interest on this stock. So this was like a, it was like a preferred stock, which is in perpetuity because it would call by the convenience of the government after five years. So now they had a security that hopefully would be traded as par, that could be used as collateral for loans. It was met with only well, overwhelming success. And the nice thing was they had money in the budget through the tax appropriations that they thought was going to cover it. Every, everything was fine. So it was met with overwhelming success. So the today, it was the securitization of the debt of the Republic in 1837 was the single most important refinancing of the Republic era. Biggest problem was they passed this on June the 9th of 1837. The stock was June the 7th of 1837. They began to issue the stock in September. But on June the 9th, two days later, Congress created a paper money system because they didn't have anything exchangeable to which to pay off the Treasury warrants. They authorized $500,000 in money printed out of thin air, which those promissory notes would also pay 10% interest, which would suck up all the revenues that were going to be used to pay the interest on the consolidated fund. This was the beginning of the debt crisis of the Republic of Texas. It happened right as the Panic of 1837, a five-year global credit pandemic, swept the United States. Not a really good time to plunge yourself into debt and have a lot more interest obligations, but it's just the epic struggle for money, credit, and independence in the Republic of Texas, not just to achieve independence, but how they managed to, and they just struggled to stay independent the whole time. And I wanted to thank you all for the opportunity to present this. We'd be happy to take questions, and thanks for letting me share that story with you.
Thank you, Jim. Uh, as, in, as in the case with our other two speakers this morning, we have time for one or two questions before we break for lunch. Do we have any uh, uh, desperate uh, question answerers or askers? Yes, sir. Just a comment. The steamboat that went from Lynchburg to uh, Galveston, was that steamboat one? Well, actually, that... Um, they, they took a schooner, I believe it was the schooner Flash, which took them from um, New Washington to Galveston. The Cayuga was chugging up and down there. And you have to realize that the steamboat in the vignette, you know, in the, the picture there with the bluffs, that was the artist's conception of the steamboat. That, that engraving was actually done in, by an engraver in Philadelphia, New York, for the banknote company. So it's an artist's conception of But there was a steamboat there, and there was a bluff there, and there was Burnett and the rowboat there, and there was the, the schooner there. So just, you know, he used a little bit of imagination on that one. But yes, sir. Having a, the, the New York and the, the investment group from New York having gotten involved early on in the land speculation, why did they take a back seat to the New Orleans people when the financing came around? Well, they're all the, why did the New Orleans, well, the New Orleans people, the New York people really didn't take a, a back seat to the New Orleans people. There were a lot of New Yorkers in that lending group in New Orleans. It was just that uh, Triplett and Gray were the designated representatives to represent the lending group, and they actually traveled to Washington on the Brasses, then they traveled to Harrisburg. One more. Those uh, land grant certificates that they first printed, did they? The, the Texian loans? What? You mean the Texian loans that are for New yeah, Orleans? Right. Yeah. The, the first generate money. Did they come up with that idea first? Did they print those things in Texas before they went to New Orleans, or did they dream that up and print them there? And they, 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 printed them on, they printed them on the spot. They, they, they hired a printer within 24 hours of, 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 of reaching the agreement. And I have the original agreements that spell out all the terms of the loan in, in the appendix in the book. Thank you, Jim. Let me remind those of you who may have come in earlier, uh, come in a little late and didn't hear it, that if, uh, if you will write your questions and give them to me after our archaeology session, we will try to uh, respond to, have all of our speakers respond to written questions in our final question and answer session in the late afternoon. Uh, right now, we're going to adjourn to the Shamrock Ballroom for lunch. And we'll be back at uh, 1.45. Thank you.